we're going to talk about a Sunday evening surprise. A Sunday evening surprise. The text is there before you. I invite you to turn to it in your Bible. And uh, maybe it's because Pastor Mick wasn't here on Resurrection Sunday. Maybe that's why we have to go here. I don't know. But uh, the resurrection of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the literal bodily, res physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is so vital to the Christian gospel that all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give us eyewitness accounts of what transpired and provide for us multiple evidences of its reality. The uh, One of the uh, great uh, men of our faith who talked about proofs for the resurrection says there is more physical, literal proof that Jesus died and rose again than there is that Julius Caesar ever set foot on this planet. But I have to tell you, we have no photos. And so it is still a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith. The resurrection is a historical fact, not a theory. Jesus was a historical person, died an actual historical death, rose from the dead in real history. He rose in physical form, though a glorified physical form. You'll hear about that today. This is so significant that the records are all laid out by the four gospel writers, and you have to know they wrote at different times in different places for different reasons. They didn't sit down in a room and the four of them go, well, let's see if we can pull this thing together. They're in different spaces and places at the time when they sit down to pen the words. Then the Apostle Paul reviews it all in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If the crucifixion means that God prepared and sacrificed himself for the redemption and reconciliation of humankind, the resurrection means that God was satisfied with the sacrifice that Jesus, the Son of God, offered. It means that he did conquer death, not only for himself, but for all of us who put our faith in him. And eternal life is now once again available to all of humankind. God's intention was that we never die. That's why you get upset at a funeral. This was not supposed to happen. That was never God's intention. But we slammed the door in his face. But in his resurrection, Jesus' resurrection is now our resurrection. In his cross is our forgiveness and reconciliation. And his resurrection is our assurance and our hope for eternal life. So Jesus died, and by his own word, three days and three nights later, he rose from the dead. And the disciples don't know yet. So now what? That's what they're all saying. That's what you know, some of you say when you look at the resurrection. You say, so now what? So he died. I'm forgiven. That's good. If I put my faith in Jesus Christ, he will erase the penalty of my past. But now what? Well, let's go back. And read the story again. Can we do that? Now I'm going to pull pieces from all of the Gospels to pull this together. Are you ready? So the crucifixion is three days earlier. The disciples, you have to know, are all in hiding, trapped by fear and doubt. They are anything but bold. Jesus has risen, but they don't know it yet. So the text that we're going to work from when we get there is John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23. And if you're there already, you can see that the first line tells you that they are in a locked room on the day of the resurrection. 
The door is barred for fear that they would also be arrested as the followers of Jesus with the possibility of execution looming large for them as accomplices in his crime. They are anxious, they are fearful, they are frightened, terrified of what would befall them. The last thing that they're expecting is a resurrection. At this point, they aren't even considering it as a possibility. May I remind you before we go further that Jesus told them that he would rise. And every time he did, the Bible says, and they discussed amongst themselves what he meant by that. But they'd seen a resurrection. It happened to Lazarus. It happened with the woman from Nain. It happened from with Tabitha and the uh, and and the synagogue ruler, the synagogue ruler's daughter. They had been raised from the dead. I don't know why it could not cross, possibly cross their minds as a relevant reality. But despite what the Old Testament taught, and despite what Jesus had said. Never crossed their minds. So why is it then, you might ask, if you know your Bible well, that they preach the resurrection all the way until their death? Why is it that they preach their crucified and resurrected Messiah to the Jewish community and then blew out beyond that into the rest of the world? Why is it that they were all of a sudden, after these guys, as we find them this morning, trapped in a room, are able to work against hatred, opposition, persecution, suffer physical violence, so that eventually all of them, but the Apostle John, will give their lives as martyrs for the gospel It was the resurrection. Anyone who denies the resurrection would have to come up with a really good reason why these cowards all of a sudden became changed men. Now, our Lord came out of the grave on Saturday night. You know that, right? The Jews were on a different time clock than you. The next day began at sunset. The day started and began at sunset. Did not at midnight. And that's why sometimes when you read through the Gospels, it's different because some of them are on Greek time and some of them are talking the old Hebrew way. Jesus rose Saturday night. Why? Because the Sabbath ended at sunset. Three days and three nights, he left sometime during the night. Very early the next morning, nobody knowing that this had transpired yet, they all are on their way out to anoint his body. And it's the women. Before dawn on Sunday morning, hoping to arrive at the tomb by dawn so that they can get this done. Upon their arrival at the tomb, they find that the stone has been rolled away, the garden is quiet, the seal is broken, the soldiers are gone. At this point, Mary Magdalene takes off to get Peter and John. You can see her taking off in the corner over there. She doesn't even wait to find out what comes next. But Luke records it in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 3 to 8 says, but when they got to the tomb, they went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in gleaming clothing stood near them. As the women were terrified, they bowed their faces to the ground, and the men said to them, why are you seeking the living one among the dead, he is not here, he has been raised. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise from the dead. Verse 8, and they remembered his words. 
If there was anything that you should underline in your Bible in Luke 24, it would be verse 8. And they remembered his words. Why? Because nobody else will. The women can believe because they can remember. Let's go to the next part of the story. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, picks it up there at verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them on the way. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, like I told them. There they will see me. Luke chapter 24 and verse 9. But they came back from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and the others. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them. There's a whole pack of ladies. Told this to the apostles. All credible figures. But you can see verse 11 at the bottom of the screen. But the words appeared to them, that's to the eleven, as nonsense. And they refused or would not believe. So adverse were they to the idea of a resurrection. They wouldn't believe the most credible people in their circle. So here we go. The women have gone to the grave. The tomb is empty. The grave clothes are lying there. There's no explanation. I told you Mary ran off to get Peter and John. They took two different routes because they didn't cross with each other. Jesus meets the women, and Peter and John are running towards the tomb with Mary in on their tail. Oh, they're there. She's already run from the tomb, so she's a little peaked. But Peter and John are going full steam forward. The problem is that Peter and John get to the tomb. They look around. The angels aren't there. Nobody's there. The grave clothes are there. They can see them. But they leave. Shortly thereafter, Mary Magdalene arrives and has her encounter. And she runs back to corroborate the story of the others. But Peter and John had already been. And they said, Mary... It's been a rough few days. I mean, ladies, ladies, all of you, it's been a difficult three days. Why don't we all just take a deep breath? This is nonsense. So John chapter 20, verse 9, begins this way. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, that's resurrection day, the disciples had gathered together, this is evening now, and locked the doors of the place because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus comes in among them, that's what the Bible says, and stands in their midst and says, peace be with you. Might I remind you that the door, can you see Mary Magdalene? I mean, I don't know if she locked the door, but that's who this guy thinks did. Mary Magdalene, can you see her locking the door up there? So Jesus gets in through the wall. That's your body, 2.0, if you're a believer in Jesus after this. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. How did that happen? Well, the same way he got out of the grave. We only rolled away the stone to show that he was gone. He'd already left hours before. He was already out of there. You say, how did he get get out? You know, Pastor, I read that thing. They wrapped 75 pounds of thick linen soaked in, 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 in spices and stuff all around him from the feet up to the neck and then they put the head scarf on him. I mean, he couldn't move. He just suffocated in 75 pounds of cloth. Well, he managed to get through a locked door and get out through a 
cave wall. I don't think 70 pounds, 75 pounds of linen was going to hold him much. And the testimony of multiple eyewitnesses is that they're in a locked room and all of a sudden Jesus stands in the midst of the room. Push off. Some of you are believers in this room who have been praying for someone for years. You've got family members and friends. Can I remind you that uh, a locked door can't keep Jesus out? Can I remind you this morning and encourage you that this is a picture of the effects of your prayers for your beloved family member, friend, or co-worker? They may have the door shut, locked, and bolted, but the truth of the matter is that you need to keep praying because Jesus doesn't get held up by locked doors. Jesus does not get held up by anything. If he is going somewhere, he said, here's what I'll tell you. He said, your prayers will send me where you at. Let me tell you that your Jesus has been behind the locked doors that they're presenting to you. That he is working behind those locked doors as you plead for their eternal destiny. They've locked the doors to others, but they can't change the prayer of a righteous person that the Bible says is powerful and effective. And my Jesus, the risen and resurrected Lord, goes through locked doors of human hearts, sealed up spaces in people's minds, and stands in the middle of their unbelief, looks around and says, hey, fellas. And the thing is, I know how he shows up because it's how he shows up here. When he shows up here, the first thing he does not do is chew them all out. Did you notice that? Some of you, if it was your kids, what's wrong with you? I told you I would be at the mall at 5 o'clock. I know. But Jesus came among them and said to them these words, peace be with you. Now you know if you know Jesus, Jesus is not a Canadian, Jesus is a Jew. And it takes more than one word to translate the one word he said. What did he say to them? Say it again. Come on, no, you are being shy. This is not the time. Shalom. Thank you very much. I knew you were there. He did not say shame on you for doubting. He didn't chew them out for their unfaithfulness and cowardice when they took off and left him alone in the garden. No, he did not. Here's the confidence you have when he's dealing with your family member or, or, or your friend when you're praying for them. Now remember, we've pushed pause on the story for a minute. We're talking about a locked door. Jesus gets through that locked door and he will not chew your friend out. Maybe they would like him to rain down fire and brimstone, but he does not do that. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only, one unique son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. The next verse says, for God did not send his son into the world to do what? Condemn it. He's not here to yell at you. Did you hear me? If you are expecting Jesus to meet your son or your daughter, your mom or your dad, your friend or your co-worker and give them a scolding, what do they say in France that you told me? Oh, yeah, good luck with that. Why? Psalm 103. For he does not treat us as our sins deserve. He does not repay us according to our guilty deeds. Yes, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. So 
But rather than chew them out, <laughs> shalom. Now, that would be the right thing to say, too, because the trauma after digging your heels in in unbelief must have been shocking. I've met people who dug their heels in against Jesus for years, and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, because I'm not God and I don't know what he was doing with them, I find them somewhere on their knees or in my office. Or at Tim Hortons talking to the kids. Or at the lunch table talking to their co-workers saying, listen, about that Jesus guy. Why? Because <laughs> he comes and he doesn't shout at them. He says, shalom. He comes in the door and says, peace be with you. Your life is in chaos. There's a storm going on in your family. There's a storm going on in your finances. There's a storm going on. The shop's going to shut down. Now what are you going to do? And he walks in the door, calm and cool as a cucumber, and your Jesus says, Shalom. Peace. Take it down a notch. If those on the road to Emmaus were traumatized when they recognized him a few hours earlier, if the women were in a state of shock that morning when he appeared to them on the road, when Mary Magdalene just about busted out of her shell, when she turned around and found he was standing right behind her the whole time that she was bemoaning his loss, you have to know that uh, Jesus knows what to do. In fact, if you're in John's Gospel, chapter 20, you'll find out that he says, peace be with you, and then there's an outbreak, and then he says it again. Shalom. Fellas, ladies, peace. The God of peace raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus said, there's nothing to be afraid of here. Because of his sacrifice on the cross, men and women can have peace with God. They can enjoy the peace of God. The work of the cross is peace. And the message that the men would carry after this moment would be the gospel of peace. Man screwed up and rebelled against God. But God would walk into their lives in any time. And you're praying for a friend or a family member. Remember that Jesus goes through locked doors and he walks into their lives and says these words. Shalom. Peace be with you. Now you can shake it off. You can walk away. You can stand in denial if you want. But I'll tell you, I double dog dare you. If you'll stand still long enough and you're standing outside the circle now and you got a family member on the inside pleading with Jesus for you, if you'll stand still long enough, you'll hear these words. Peace be with you. Oh, and about that marriage relationship and the finances and the job, we can work on that. Now, they were still really excited, so the Bible says that he showed them his hands and feet to assure them he was not a ghost that he was not a spirit, he was not a phantom. You might think if he can move through walls, well, he's kind of like a, a ghost. And he says, listen, fellas, look at this. Did anybody bring lunch, he said. I mean, we had 5,000 people and none of you, lunch. Somebody said, we still have that fish. Bring it on. The Bible says that he ate the broiled fish they gave in front of them to let them know he is not an apparition or a hallucination. He has a glorified body, a resurrected body, but it is not a spirit body. It is tangible nonetheless. And of course, at the end of verse 20, the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. What an understatement. I think the whole, whole heaven broke loose in the room. 
the most unpretentious way I can imagine to describe those men reacting after digging in their heels and he shows up and he shows them the scars and he calls them to peace and then he eats some lunch and everybody goes, you gotta be kidding. So Jesus says after the Fuhrer breaks out, um, peace be with you. <laughs> Come on guys, I got, I, I'm, I'm not here without purpose. He de-escalates them. Calm down. I know, I know. Peace. Peace. We often talk about the fact that what someone says before they die is important. Usually people don't trivialize at the moment of death what they say in their last breath is significant. Then, then I need you to consider the first things that Jesus says. The first thing he says after he rises from the dead. First words out of his mouth are what? Peace. Peace. How critical is that? So straightforward. So concise. Then he says these words. As the Father has sent me, so I also send you. So simple. Peace. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Three things. Let's talk about them. First words out of Jesus' mouth. Number one, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. There it is. As the Father sent me, for the Son of Man has come, he said at the beginning, to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. He had no other purpose. His purpose was salvation. He came to save the lost. Jesus came into the world, Paul writes to Timothy, for this purpose, to save sinners. For God so loved the world. I read this, I recited this to you earlier. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life, so eternal life is a really long time. If you ever considered that? You consider the alternative. You know that there's only two options, right? There's no third possibility. I'd pick that one. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's why you and I are standing here, because Father sent Jesus for the purpose of letting us know that there was a mission on tap. So just as you sent me into the world, Jesus is praying in John 17. The disciples are listening. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. Oh, so he said it a second time. Oh, yes, he did. And I give myself, he said before the cross, as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I'm going to transform them. Holy simply means separated for a purpose. I'm going to make them holy. I'm going to separate them for a purpose. Jesus did not attack any human institution. He didn't come to teach humankind for academic and educational purposes. He did not come for philanthropic purposes. He never engaged in any effort to rem remedy government or social issues. He came into the world to seek and to save the lost. And that's why all believers exist in the world today. You and I, friends, are the credibility of the gospel in the community. I notice far too many people heading towards politics these days. Sure, do your politics, but that's not your Jesus. And don't screw up and put the two of them together. Because your Jesus didn't. You'll say, well, this and that... 
back and find me where Jesus reams out Caesar and the Roman government, takes the, takes the soldiers to task. Go. Does he do that? Ever? Anywhere? Never. Does that mean he was not concerned? Well, clearly he was taking care of the poor. He was healing the sick. He was dealing with the spiritual and the social needs of people. Why? Because I know that on the night that he was betrayed, when Judas left the room after the, uh, after the supper, he slipped out of the room. Jesus said, go do your worst to him. But all the other disciples thought he'd gone out to do what? Read it in John's Gospel. They thought he'd gone out because it was time to give alms to the poor. You have to take care of your people that are around you. That's your job. That's my job. That is our task in this world. If you and I say Jesus changed our life, then we'd better be living a changed life. Because the Apostle Paul says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything. I mean everything. And if you can't do it for the glory of God, first question, what are you doing? People are telling me, my life is so full. Okay. Whatever you do, do everything for the glory. If you can't do it for the glory of God, two people's time are being wasted. One of them is yours. We are to live holy lives, wholly dedicated to the glory of God. If we live a changed life and somebody connected to you or to me says, you're different, why? We explain about Jesus. Then that makes the gospel credible. Or does it? On so many occasions, the gospel is only as credible as the person sharing. Jesus said everything we do in our lives is to let our light shine for him. That's what he told us. You are the light of the world. A city sitting on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand for all the people in the house, your light, what, must shine. Before people in such a way that they see your good works. Oh, so you are, you and I are supposed to be out there doing things. Because to see good works, we have to be doing them. And glorify your Father is in heaven. In heaven. Why are they doing that? Because they're seeing the transformation from who you were to who you are. They're seeing the difference between someone who is in Christ and someone who is not. They are incredibly kind, helpful, oh, compassionate people in this culture. I meet them all the time. And we are to be numbered among them. And the difference between us and them is at the end of the day, we smile and say, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no problem, no problem. <laughs> the grace of God's at work in me, and he just told me I needed to get out and love people, and today, today you're, you're, you're the one in line. Man, I'm so glad to be able to be here and to help you and do whatever needs to be done. Because in these unusual times, we forget this. So what did you do with the commission? As the Father sent me, so send I. And that includes me too, by the way. So yes, we're here to praise God together on Sunday morning for his goodness, his mercy, and his grace, and to pray for others, because that's part of our witness. Praise and prayer are critical aspects of our spiritual maturing and our sanctification. Yes, we're here to learn the truth. Yes, we're here to serve. Yes, we're here to encourage one another. All of that is part of growing up in the community of faith, and it's so critical. I always appreciate that Pastor Mick brings you back to 
of the circle and says, listen, your job here is to turn around and shake somebody. If you don't know who they are, <laughs> find out who they are. Why? Because everybody in the circle matters. Oh, and may I be so bold? The people outside of the circle matter too. So the same hand that you would extend to someone behind you in the bench this morning should come out of your pockets on the job. At the doctor's office. That same verbal word of greeting. Why? Well, because your Lord said it this way, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Don't forget them, because you and I, we were once them. That's the first thing. The second thing Jesus did is he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Why did that matter? Well, it's absolutely critical to the task. When the Son of God came into the world, the Father sent him, but the Spirit came with him. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary so that she would have the boy at his incarnation. He became one of us, born of a woman. Because of his self-limiting in order to live the life that we live and do the teaching and the healing, he yielded himself completely to the influence of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people I know are under the influence. I want you to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Because as the Father sent Jesus into the world, he sends us. As the Father sent Jesus into the world, he didn't send him alone. He sent him with the Spirit to empower him. In fact, that's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. What is born of the flesh is flesh. When you're natural born, you're natural born. But what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be shocked when I say to you, you must be born from above. Your spiritual life has to be refreshed and renewed without being born of the spirit we can't walk the way that jesus walked we can't expect to do the things that he tells us to do but on that night when he met them he breathed on them and if you go back to genesis then the lord god formed the man from the dust of the ground he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and he became what and that night Jesus breathed on them, and they received the life of God once more. For you were dead, Ephesians said, in your transgressions and sin that you used to live, but God, rich in mercy, doing for you, that's what mercy is, doing for you what you can't do for yourself. He loved us so much that even though we were dead in our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace been saved for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we're united with Christ he gave us the spirit which gave us life eternal life Michael Keith Curtis Jr. this morning has eternal life now and should he or I meet the front end of a Mack truck on the way home, God forbid. All that's going to be left here is the shell. His wife will get it all gussied up and we'll all have a good cry. <laughs> but he's not dead. He's very much alive. He's just someplace else. And someday, <laughs> someday, Jesus is going to pull him back together. And he'll get a body just like Jesus had. And so will you. Shoot, we can still go for lunch. Do you think we have to do fish, though? Wings would be nice. In that great new covenant passage, Ezekiel 36, God promised long before this ever happened. Here, watch this now. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Do you know that you're clean? 
I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, and I will remove from you your heart of stone that digs in its heels, that says, I can't, when you recognize with the Spirit of God, the Apostle Paul said these words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You notice how many times God says, I will, in there? You notice how little involvement you have in this part of the process? I need you to know that you didn't work for that. There's nothing you can do. I'm just telling you that he did it already. It's a done deal. God has given you his spirit. And he's given you a task to do. So the first thing our post-resurrection Lord wants us to know is that we've got a job. The second thing he wants us to know is that you're not the people you were before. I'm going to give you the same Holy Spirit. Can you imagine this? The same Holy Spirit that I had. The third and final element is this. Jesus says in John 20, 23, if you're following along in John's gospel, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now, this has been twisted inside out by a thousand people, other religious systems. They've made it apply only to specially designated religious figures. But that's not what happened that night. You see, Jesus is not talking just to the 11 apostles. Because he's there, not all that are in the room, are they? Who's there? All the women are there. <laughs> Who else is there? Well, the two from Emmaus at the very least. The room is packed full. And so Jesus said, the rest of you stand aside now as I give to my apostles. Is that what he said? He said to you. Well, how does that work? Because, Pastor, I've read my Bible, and I understand. So why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's God's prerogative. How can that possibly be mine? And Daniel, Daniel says, To the Lord our God belong mercy and... That's God's job. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't go around forgiving people's sins. That's God's prerogative. Well, then, how does this thing work? Acts chapter 10. We have the testimony of Peter. Listen to what he says in verse 42. God ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly testify that this is, that is Jesus, the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him the prophets bear witness, and through his name, everyone who believes in him receives what? Peter said, we've been commissioned, sent, ordered to preach. We're told that everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ re receives forgiveness of sin. So my dear brother, my dear sister, this morning, if you believed on Jesus Christ, I can hold your hands and look you in the eye and say your sins are forgiven. I didn't do it. But I can tell you, because the God I know promised that if you would confess Jesus as Savior and Lord, repent of your sins, turn from going your way, to going his way, then I can hold your hand. And you can say to me, Pastor, I just don't feel secure today. It feels uncomfortable. I'm not sure. You know what's been going on in my life? Just a second, my dear brother. Did you confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Yes, I have. Did you repent? Did you turn from your sins and give your life to walking in partnership with him? Yes, sir, I did. Did he fill you with his Holy Spirit? Well, I mean, there were some changes. Yeah, I, I recognize the changes. Then, my dear brother, I can hold your hand and say your sins are forgiven. Amen. He 
You say, but what about my emotional state? Yeah, I get emotional too when I get hungry, but... um. Hello? Your emotional state matters, squat. I want you to hear the facts. Listen, we can deal with the emotional state. There are people that are qualified to sit down and help you walk through and talk through and work through all of those issues from the past. They're there. I haven't got one of those labels on my wall, but I'd be glad to pray for you anytime. I'd be glad to hear you out. And say the words that Jesus told me that I could say to you. Listen, I don't know what happened. I'm not sure all that's gone on, but here's what I know. If you've asked Christ to come in and you've turned from going your way to his, you've stumbled perhaps along the way. But let me say to you today, with confidence in my voice, your sins are forgiven. It's a done deal. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, through him forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And through him everyone who believes is freed from all these things. What does that mean? Including the things that Moses couldn't fix. Well, God forgives all your sins. Paul says, I can tell that your sins are forgiven and that you believe in Christ because you're freed from all things, even what Moses couldn't do. Well, what could the law not do? The law could not undo the handcuffs on my life to the past patterns of sin, lifestyle issues, attitude issues. It couldn't undo that. But when I get forgiven by Jesus, click, click, I'm a free man. I can choose the way that I walk. I don't have to walk the way I don't. You say, well, my dad, my granddad, my great-granddad all had trouble with their temper. My dear friend, if you came to the foot of the cross and asked Jesus to forgive you, when it was all over, click, click, you were freed. And you don't have to do what they did. You don't have to repeat the pattern that they repeated My family's got alcohol trouble in the background. Click, click. We don't have to deal with that anymore because Jesus says you're a free man. And with you and I, we can walk in the way that I tell you we can walk. And I will give you, (laughs) Jesus said, if you'll walk with me, I will give you ways to walk in, ways that you were not accustomed to. The patterns of the past, the patterns of my parents and my poor parenting do not trap my children. I am grateful for that. Because the moment they came to Jesus, click, click. They now have the right in Christ to choose to walk in a new way. Change can come. You can sit down with somebody that can talk to you, that can help you, that will pray with you like those two gentlemen this morning. You can sit down with a Christian professional and have them help you. Why? Because he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You're not stuck. The gospel is the message of the sacrificial death and vindicating resurrection of Jesus Christ. The proof of the resurrection is the transformed lives of those who choose to follow him. Jesus said this, this is what stands written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, 
So if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. And if you retain their sins, they've been retained. Why would you retain them? Because they didn't ask God for forgiveness and there's nothing you can do about it. I can't fix it for my kids. I can't fix it for my dad. But I have a Jesus who goes through locked doors. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have a Jesus who goes through closed minds. Amen? I have a Jesus who stands and intercedes alongside of me for family and friends who are stuck. And he empowers them to change as he's empowering me. Only God can forgive sins. But God, thank God, does forgive sins. I told you, you die in your sins if you don't believe. You will die in your sins. Just a reality. But whoever believes in the Son has what? Eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son, well, they won't see life. God's wrath remains on them. So let's pray about this, shall we? Because my life is not all it should be yet. There are some mindsets that are in this man that still need to be adjusted. And my wife said, Amen. Why? Because I'm not perfect yet. But here's the thing. I've linked arms with Jesus and he forgave my sins in my past. He's forgiven my sins in the present. He's given me the power of the Holy Spirit and a job to do. He says, let's walk together. Let's get her done, preacher. I said, I'm coming. Are you? Father, today in this room, we celebrate the power of your resurrection that freed us from the past patterns of life that scarred us, that hurt us, that marked us. For the things that we did that we don't even want to talk about, God, you forgave us because you said you would. And so, Father, today, in Jesus' name, if there's one, if there's one in this room, some mother's child, some sister's brother or brother's sister, some family member or friend who's not yet stepped across that line and received forgiveness of sin, hallelujah, who has not found out that they can receive the power of the Holy Spirit to change in the way they've been struggling to change for years, who will get a mission from you to go and to, through their lives and their actions, demonstrate the transformation that God is daily working out in them. That their past is forgiven and done with as far as God's concerned, and they now have the security and the assurance of eternal life. If there's one in this room who does not have that, Lord, I'll ask for you today. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we'll do this the old-fashioned way. If you need Christ and you want him to transform your life, I'm, gonna need you, I'm just going to ask you to slip up your hand. I'm not going to manipulate you. I just want to pray for you. I want to pray for you if you want the change. Because God's waiting to make the change today. Is there any? If you're online this morning and you're watching me, whenever you're watching me, I'm going to pray in just a moment. And I invite you to pray along with me so that the life that has come to me and to us can come to you wherever you are. Father, on the evening of Resurrection Day, you sent your son to disrupt some people who dug their heels in. And we thank you once again that you leave no man behind. 
that you call for each one. We thank you again for the clarity and the understanding that floods our hearts and minds as we contemplate these historical eyewitness accounts and how they apply to our lives today. Thank you for their glory, the glory of Scripture that shows you that you are ready to come alongside of us, to offer us peace, to cut us off from the sins of our past and to forgive us and to give us a future. And Father, today, if one is struggling in this house who is yours and is struggling with things that have happened, I pray that you will let them know they're forgiven. Father, if there is someone in this house who is struggling for a family member or a friend, I pray you will let them know that you are still the God who walks through shut doors and closed minds and hearts. And that your spirit can work anywhere if we will open the door in prayer. And for one who is listening, who is struggling today and wants to receive that grace, Father, I invite them to pray as I prayed long ago. Lord Jesus, forgive me for my past, for my offenses against you. Today, God, I choose to turn from the past and look into the future with you. I ask that you would forgive my sins as you promised. I ask that you would give me your Holy Spirit so that my life can be changed and I can begin to reflect the life and do those things that you're asking of me. I thank you today that you have done these things because you sent your son Jesus who died and rose again and sent the Holy Spirit to empower me to live a new life. I ask that you would do that in me today. In Jesus' name, amen.